my good friend Lyle here is one of the rare individuals that actually makes real money with vintage computers. He's been doing this for a decade and a half. He's got more heavy iron in his possession than, than most people would ever understand. Uh, more tonnage than most scrappers. To the point where he actually looks like one most of the time. And the good news is that he gets this stuff working. He makes his equipment sing. And what he's going to tell you today is what to do with your new equipment, your new old stuff, when you get it home so that you don't make that magic smoke that we're all so used to. So with that quick introduction, Lyle, if you would take it away. Okay, thank you, Eric. Well, first of all, um, I've already been threatened by Ed up here that he's going to heckle me. I want you to know that we have bouncers. And so uh, um, heckling's allowed, but you may be bounced. Okay, so, okay. No, seriously, I want this to be uh, interactive. I don't want to just be up here and, and talk. I think, I think Eric said it was all right if I went for three hours. Uh, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> you want me to talk for three hours? Are you crazy? <laughs> okay, so let me talk a little bit about my background because that, that probably helps a little bit. And also talk a little bit about why are we even talking about the subject? Why are we talking about the subject of collecting? Why are we here? You know, what, what is this all about? Um, so uh, let's take a look at this. I think one of the reasons we do it, of course, is for fun. Uh, there's something about, for those of us who, who make machines work, there's something really cool about making it work, just having it work, just having it do its thing after, you know, a certain amount of time of not working. So that's cool. It's also a great education. You know, we learn a lot when we make machines work. It forces us to learn logic, it forces us to learn how to repair things. A lot of times it, it helps us do things that we've never thought about doing, replacing bearings or doing something that, you know, maybe mechanically we're not that oriented, but boy, when you get into vintage computing, you find yourself having to do that kind of stuff, don't you? And, uh, or maybe you're, you're more on the mechanical side and you're not used to doing the electronic side. Well, when you do vintage computing and res restoration of vintage computers, you find yourself doing both. So let me do a sound check first of all. Is, is, can everybody hear me okay? Are we all, well, a little louder? Is that better? Okay, good, okay. So the other thing is a lot of times it's just fun to restore a computer so we can play with it. Uh, you know, because they're fun things to play with. They're fun, you know, they're not just learning tools, but they're fun. Uh, also, you can, co you can show the cool stuff to your friends, right? And that's fun too. But for business, you know, which is something that I have done also, because I, I like all that first stuff that I talked about, all the fun stuff. But also I've done it for business. I've, I've, I've restored machines in order to resell them because a restored machine that's running is a lot more valuable than a machine that doesn't run. But secondly, I've done a lot of work with lawyers. I've been involved in a lot of court cases here in Silicon Valley where I've produced artifacts for exhibits and trials as an as ex expert witness in trials. Uh, so it's, it can be also a, a, a fun thing. And also you can trade things. Uh, a lot of times folks will say, well, I don't want to pay for this, but I'll be willing to trade you for something else. So it's a, a, great, uh, a great thing to do just for the trading. So in addition to the fun, there's, there's other elements that from a monetary standpoint, it makes sense to restore computers. Uh, so it isn't just a cost center, it can actually be a profit center. Uh, when I've worked with law firms, I never let them buy the equipment, I was renting the equipment. So uh, that's what I've done for 15 years. And so I restore a machine and they rent it and sometimes they'll rent it for over two years. Um, and then I get it back and I get to use it again in another court case. So that, that's kind of cool. Uh, it helps pay for a hobby, right? Which is a good thing. So anyway, let's move along and let's talk. I just want to show you, and I want to bore you with this because this could get boring. This, these are the computers that I actually have in my my, my inventory, um, and there's a bunch of them. You can look at my website and you can see them. This is one of them that I love. This is my PDP-8S. Um, this is the innards of the PDP-8S. This is the PDP-8E running Space War. That's with the lights turned out. 
Um, this is a, uh, oh yeah, this one's actually a movie. This is uh, one of my favorite machines. This is a uh, HP 2100S uh, mini computer. And I also like analog computers. These are two that I restored recently. Uh, I picked them up here in Silicon Valley. They were both busted, but they were pretty easy to fix. So let's talk about how we do restoration, because I suspect that's what most of you came here to hear is a little bit of experience talking. So uh, there's some things that you do to anything that you get. And I don't care whether it's a microcomputer or a mini computer or an analog computer, you name it. These are common things that you do for all computers. And the first thing I'd suggest that you do is create a logbook. Now, my experience is that many collectors don't do this. They just start working on something, and they start restoring it. But creating a logbook is something that is really valuable because if you log everything you do, what happens is when you uh, stop and you put it aside for two weeks and you come back, you can really remember where you, what you were working on. Uh, or you can have two or three projects running and you can move between them and look at your logbook and remember where you were on each of them. So that's a, it's a very wise thing to do. And so for every computer or everything that you're restoring, you know, write a logbook. And, uh, and, we'll, and a little later, we'll show, I'll show you some entries in logbooks to show you, give it a feel for what's in there. But basically, all you have to do is put date, time, your observation about what's going on and what actions you've taken. The, the second thing that's uh, common to any restoration is getting the manuals and the schematics. It is really difficult to work on a machine without schematics. It can be done, but it's hard, and it's really hard. So uh, what, before I get an item, a lot of times I will you know, research it and find all the manuals I can. And let me give you just quickly a couple of hints about that process. I mean, obviously one of the first places that I look is BitSavers, because that's a very good place, bitsavers.org, and there's lots and lots of manuals there. But also you can just do Google searches, but, but sometimes that doesn't work either. So what do you do when Google searches fail and BitSavers fail? How do you get manuals and how do you get schematics? Well, one of the things that I found works, and you have to be really genteel about this, you can never be anxious, you can never be demanding, you have to be really nice. And what you do is you find out who now owns the company. Let's suppose the company, a lot of these companies, like, I'll give you an example. I was, I was restoring a Nicolet oscilloscope, and it was pretty old. So I called uh, the company that had purchased Nicolet here in the US, and I said, I have this old oscilloscope, and uh, I'd love to have manuals and schematics. And they, they laughed, and they, the person I was talking to just literally laughed, and they said, oh my gosh, we have, that hasn't been, we haven't seen one of those in 25 years. You know, like, uh, I don't think we have any manuals, but I'll call you back. And they called me back and said, we don't have any manuals. We don't have any schematics, it's long gone. I said, well, where was this created? Where was this box made? And they said, oh, it was made in Europe. I said, do you have any contacts in Europe? And they said, oh yeah, we still have a corporate entity there. Well, well maybe we can call you back about that. So they called me back and they said, oh, we found, we found the engineer that designed it. So, would you, so do you want to talk to him? And I said, sure. So I called him in Europe and I said, um, hey, um, you know, I'm working on this oscilloscope, and he just starts laughing. He said, oh my gosh, he said, that's an ancient thing. He said, it was a terrible scope. <laughs> that's something the marketing people would never say, right? He said, it was a terrible scope, had a lot of problems with it, blah, 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 blah. And I said, yeah, but it's so cool looking, and I'd love to get it working again. And he said, oh, good luck on that. I said, I don't have any schematics. He said, I know you don't. I said, why do you know that? He said, because we didn't publish them. <laughs> I said, well, okay, why is that? And he said, oh, we had a service center. He said, we made money in the service center, so you sent it back and we'd charge you for it. I said, what a bummer. I said, it's good for you, but I said, that's a bummer for a collector. He said, eh, probably. He says, wait a second. And I hear Russell, Russell. He said, oh, I just found the manual in my desk. He said, 
do you want the manual and the schematic? He said, I'll give you the masters. I said, I said don't, don't you want them? He said, he said Lyle, nobody's, nobody's asked for these for years. He said, you can have them. They shipped them to me free of charge. Okay? Um, sometimes you have to be a little devious, and I'm, I don't want to give away too many hints because, I'll, you know, this is not good, but uh, especially if they're devious. But I'll, do, I'll give you one devious one I did. Uh, just, and I'm not going to talk this long on any other subject, but this is a, because this is a really important one, because it's really important to have manuals and schematics. I was looking, this was an analog computer, not the ones I just showed you, but another analog computer that I got. And again, I couldn't get any schematics at all for it. Uh, nothing online. But I did have the name of the company. They still had a website, but it was a dead website. You know what a dead website is? It's one that hasn't been updated for a skillion years. And it's just there, static. But on there, it had a phone number. So I called the phone number, and it rang and rang and rang. And I got a, you know, a message that said, blah, 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 company, leave a message. And I did that for like three months. You know, I call them like once a week, three months. No answer, no call back. So I'm like, mm, this is not good. Maybe, you know, who knows where this is going? So what I did was I, uh, uh, on the website, it had the name of the president of the company. Right? So I tried to look him up on Google, and the only thing I could find was a, an exact matching name of somebody that had rental property in Colorado. So I said, hmm, you know, I can't get his phone number. It's not on the website. But I called the rental thing, and I said, I'm interested in renting property. I said, I understand you have such and such a place, and, you know, and they go, Oh, yeah, we do. I said, but I want to talk to the owner first. And they said, oh, okay. We'll give you his private unlisted phone number. They gave me his private unlisted phone number. I called him up. And I said, hi, my name's Lyle. He said, you've been leaving messages, you know, and I haven't been returning them on purpose. How did you get this number? And I told him. I just confessed to him how I did it. He said, well, you're a genius. He said, you got to me. Now that you got to me, what do you want? And I said, I want the manuals for this. And he said, we don't have that. That was made for the Navy. And we didn't ever publish the manual for that or the schematics. I said, so what do I do? He said, are you willing to pay me something for it? I said, sure. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, for $100, I will pull together the user manual and all the schematics for it, and I'll send it to you. I said deal. And so I PayPal'd him the money, he sent me the schematics and everything. So it was a little devious, but you, ha you, you know, the, the thing is, you never make a, met anybody angry with you, you're just nice. And, you, and, and, and like I said, I confessed to him how I got to him. I didn't try to hide it, I didn't try to be sneaky, I just was totally open and honest about what I did, and he thought it was cool, right? So, I mean, so I'm not suggesting you always do that kind of thing, but you, you do what you have to do to get manuals and schematics, so that's really critical. Uh, once you get the manuals, what you want to do is obviously study the manuals and how to service the unit if it tells you that kind of information. So you want to do that. And then finally, once you've done all of this background stuff, now you start playing with the machine. You can open it up, you can do the cleaning, because a lot of times it's tricky just to get into the machine, right, or the box. And so the manuals help and, and can help you in a significant way do that. So once you do that and you get the dust and you clean the exterior and you do all this stuff that we probably, most all of us would, would do anyway, um, the, the critical thing is once you open the unit, it's either, you know, the best thing is to have a camera ready and take pictures of what it looks like. The reason is it's too easy when you're doing a restoration and you're cleaning to knock something off or to you know, move a cable and now I don't know where this cable goes or oh look, oh that dirt under, under the motherboard, I'll pull this module out and then you pull another module out and you say well which one goes where, right? If you take a picture and you take pictures as you go along, it helps a lot be able to put things back together again. So that's a really smart thing to do. Um, and also, if the manual has board layouts, obviously, you know, have that in front of you so that you can put it all back together after you get finished cleaning it. Uh, and 
and you obviously want to go through and look at all the cables, how they're connected, look at all the jumpers that may be on a board, uh, how they're set. You know, there's all these little jumpers that could easily be, or switches are nasty because it's easy when you're clean to, to modify switches. So you want to, you know, again, you want to take pictures and as much detail as you might think you would need so that, you know, if, you, if when you're cleaning something or you're working on it and you brush up against the switch and modify it, you know what it was set for before you started. Now, some of you may say, well, I got the manual, I can figure it out, but sometimes it's really bad, <laughs> right? I see some of you shaking your head in agreement, but that's, but it's true, it's gonna be really bad trying to find out what switches ought to be turned a certain way. And so you wanna look at all the jumpers over the top connectors, et cetera, everything. Take pictures, make notes. And obviously, you want to observe capacitors. They're, they're the thing that typically is bad in machines. Um, they leak. And that's, uh, if you see a leaky capacitor, I mean, physically leaking goop, like it's got some white stuff on it, or there's, uh, you, you can tell that there's a residue uh, on the capacitor, uh, it, chances are that it's physically leaking electrolyte out of the capacitor if it's an electrolytic capacitor. Uh, if it's a bulging capacitor, look, look for, instead of flat tops on capacitors, look for a rounded top. If it's rounded, it's one to be very suspicious of and probably needs replacing. And obviously, if something is broken or charred, you want to, you want to replace that as well because it's just going to get you trouble. And then, electrolytic capacitors. You want to test them with an ESR meter. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and or, uh, if you don't have an ESR meter, use a capacitance meter, check the capacitance of it, and an ohm meter to make sure that it isn't leaky. So those are, those are things that you just, you want to do, uh, especially in the power supply area, um, you know, bef before anything else. Now, once you find the, once you look through the machine and you look at the capacitors that don't meet spec, I mean, they don't, they do not, they, in terms of ESR, they don't pass, they, or in terms of capacitance, they, you know, the, the capacitor is rated for, you know, 20 microfarads and it really is only 10, or if the ohm meter shows that, you know, it's got a resistance of 100 ohms or something, you know that it's got a problem that you're gonna to have to deal with that problem. Most of the time, these problems can be dealt with by reforming the capacitor. And um, uh, it, it, in fact, it's best, and what I do personally, is anything that I get, I reform the capacitors. I just, you know, I, I test them, and of course, if they're really bad, or they're bulging, or they're doing all these other things, I would just replace them. But any of the other capacitors, I do what's called reforming the capacitor. And, uh, and then once I reform them, I test them. Now, is there any, do you want me to talk anything about reforming? Is that something? Oh, some of you want, okay, let me talk about what, that, what I mean by that then. Um, so uh, capacitors have, uh, uh, are made of foil typically, and then they have a dielectric in between the foil, and that's what, that's what creates the capacitor. What happens over time is that dielectric uh, becomes dysfunctional and it, it actually thins out. And so what happens if you don't reform a capacitor and you put voltage on it, it arcs across the capacitor and then what can happen is it creates steam inside the capacitor and if the steam builds up in the capacitor, what happens next? Boom, right? Matter of fact, the Lisa that I'm showing here uh, 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 actually had that happen. Um, I had tested everything, everything looked perfect, and uh, I, I turned it on, and it must have been on for like an hour, and all of a sudden there was this huge explosion like blam, like a firecracker going off, and then a big white cloud of smoke came out from the Lisa. Uh, that's never a fun experience, uh, but, but you know right away what it is. It's an unhappy capacitor uh, that's just blown itself to pieces. The good news is real easy to find, you know? That's the really good news. So you open up the power supply and there's this capacitor that's just blown its little self apart and you replace it. So it's not a big deal, 
but but if you if you can avoid it, <laughs> you know, uh, then uh, you're fortunate. In this case, by the way, it was not an electrolytic capacitor of all things. It was a ceramic capacitor. It's they hardly ever go out, but it did. Um, it can happen. So reforming a capacitor is this. So what what you do? Let's suppose that a capacitor is rated, and you could read it. Usually, it's right on the capacitor. It's not something you have to look up. It says like 35 volts you know, at 20 microfarads, okay? So what you want to do is you want to ensure that it's capable of, of handling 35 volts. Now, so you don't put 35 volts on it because you may get that arcing effect I was talking about. So what you do is you get a constant current power supply. They're, very, they're readily available. Um, I particularly like one from a company called Lambda, who's made power supplies for a skillion years. And you set the power supply for the voltage that's rated on the capacitor of 35 volts. But then you set the current on the, on the, uh, on the power supply for 25 milliamps or even 15 milliamps. And then you, then you put the power supply on the capacitor and turn the power supply on. And if you put a voltmeter across the capacitor, what you will see is about two or three volts. And then over time, it'll go to four volts, five volts. And then over time, it'll work its way. And this is really funny. I've observed this many times. It'll go up to the rated voltage that it was used at in the whatever computer it was. So if, if it was actually, maybe it was 25 uh, uh, volt capacitor, but it was used in a circuit that was 15 volts, it'll work its way up to 15 and it will stick. It'll sit there for a whole long time at at 15, and then it'll go inch its way up and then finally get up to the full 35 volts. And what you have done in that process is you have reformed the dielectric in the capacitor. So now when you go back and you test it, what you're gonna find after that process is that capacitor is very likely the right capacitance, and you'll find that the resistance in the capacitor is uh, you know, probably a megohm instead of, you know, 100 ohms. So you have reformed it. Sometimes capacitors, you might have to do that two or three times to it. Okay, they, not all of them reform so beautifully. Uh, some, some capacitors take 10 minutes to reform. Some capacitors take an hour to reform. Some of them take five hours to reform. Some take overnight. So uh, you don't want to rush the process. But once you've done that, you have a, essentially what is a new capacitor. Now, some people have said, oh, well, you just do the easy way. Instead of reforming the capacitor, is just go and put all new capacitors in. And in some places, I mean, I'm not against it. I'm not religious about that. If you want to put new capacitors in, that's fine. I personally like to reform them because I like to have the original artifact closer intact. And I only want to replace those things that, you know, are essential to replace. On the PDP-1, when we, when we, did, we did the PDP-1 restoration, we, we must have had 60, over 60 capacitors that we reformed, and out of that, only four did not reform that we had to replace. And, and, that, was, and that was done in between 2003 and 2005, and not one of them has ever failed in all those years. So reforming works, and it works well. And we test, the, you know, we test all the power supplies for voltage, and for Ripple and all that kind of stuff every year in preventive maintenance, and it works. So trust me, reforming capacitors is important. And, it, and, uh, and of course, as I say here, if it won't reform, you gotta replace it. It's a bad capacitor. So, okay, oh gee, I had a whole slide here on how to reform. So if any of you ask, if any of you want these, <laughs> any of you want these slides, I'm going to give you my email address after this, and you can send me an email, and I'll send you the slides. So it actually tells you here how to do it. <laughs> okay. So at any rate, there's another way to do things without reforming capacitors uh, in this in this more complicated way. Um, most computers and most test equipment have what are called switching supplies. And you can't use this technique that I'm going to talk about now in any switching supply. So you can only do it in, in linear power supplies. Typically, you could tell linear power supplies because they're big and they're heavy, because they typically have a huge transformer in them, 
uh, maybe a feral resident transformer, in which case it won't work. This, this process won't work. But if it's a standard linear power supply, this process can work in, in, and save you some hassle in terms of reforming. So if it has a linear power supply only, and I emphasize this because switching power supplies, you can destroy the power supply if you use this process. So you don't want to do it. So if it has a linear power supply, what that means is you can put low voltage on the power supply and it'll just generate low voltage output. So uh, if you have a power supply that is you know, made for 10 volts or something um, and uh, 110 volts in and you put in 10 volts, you'll get one volt out, right? You, you know, it just reduces it by whatever linear percentage uh, the power supply is. That's why it's called the linear supply. So you just take the power supply and you plug it into a variac, which just allows you to vary the voltage from zero to up to the rated you know, uh, house current. Some of them allow you to even boost it, but we're not, we don't really concern ourselves with that. So you put a uh, DC multimeter on the output of the linear supply, and you start out and you increase the voltage slowly. And I mean, you start out really slow. You, you start out with maybe, in a, in a power supply, maybe 10%. So you start out with 10 volts going into the linear supply. And you let it sit there for a while. And then you, you know, 10 minutes later or so, you, you raise it another 10 volts, and you work it up until you get to the full rated voltage of the power supply. And that often will reform capacitors and, and, uh, and work almost as well as the other way. I prefer the original way because it's more precise and it's more, in quote, scientific. But this way will work, and it's, it's possible to do, and will save you from exploding capacitors, most likely, because you're going to be raising the voltage slowly uh, on those capacitors. Also, uh, when you're doing this with the linear supply, it's important to, to pay attention to what's happening because you're not monitoring the current. Remember the other way, we had a current limiter, so we knew we were not going to exceed uh, any thresholds or anything in the capacitor. But here we're just increasing the voltage slowly. But we could have a capacitor that's really bad, uh, really a nasty, you know, a nasty shape, in which case we want to put our, our fingers around the capacitor. Now, you don't want to do this if, it's a, if it's a, the power supply is 450 volts, okay? <laughs> if, but typically in computer stuff, the voltages are low and it's not going to hurt you. And you, could, and you literally feel the electrolytic. If you're concerned, turn the power off and then feel capacitors. And then turn the power back on after you've tested. But just test it to see if it's warm um, to the touch. If it is, you got a bad capacitor. You're going to have to replace it, okay? Um, and then again, when you get finished, test, test the capacitors with a DSR meter or test them with a, a capacitance meter or a voltage meter and just replace anything that doesn't meet spec. Now, finally, we're ready to power the unit on, right, that we're going to test. We've done all this work. Notice all we've done is clean and test capacitors. We haven't, we haven't turned power on the unit itself, other than the case of linear where we've raised it. Typically, by the way, when I do a linear supply like that, I disconnect it from any of the circuits. So it's just by itself. You don't even need, on a linear supply, you don't put a load on it even. If it's a switching supply, you have to put a load on it. So now we're ready to turn power on the unit. And, uh, Again, what I would do is I would disconnect the power supply from whatever a piece of equipment that you're working on so that it doesn't supply power to any of the modules. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a system that has very few modules, maybe like a lease or something, you can, it's only got four or five modules, just pull them out so there's no modules in the, in the machine. Because the last thing you want to do is put weird voltages on modules. It's not a, not a good thing. So you pull the modules out or you disconnect the power supply. If it's a switched power supply, you put a load on it, which is typically a resistor uh, that you put across the power supply so it has a load. Switched power supplies often need that to function properly. Linear supplies are not critical that way. Um, you turn on the power, and then you make sure that all the power supply voltages are correct. 
And, uh, uh, and again, this is really a good process because we did this on, like, uh, I do this on all the computers that I restore, and we did it on the PDP-1, and uh, um, it worked for us, I mean, perfectly. Because once you know the power supplies are all the right voltages, you know you're not gonna destroy modules when you turn the power on. You know, the last thing you do is want an aberrant power supply to do something wacko to your modules. So, um, We've done a lot of stuff before we get to turn it on with, with, with uh, running equipment. Uh, so this is very different than what a lot of folks do, which is, oh, let's see what happens. Let's plug it in and see what happens. That's really a bad way uh, to think about restoring anything, whether it's a piece of test equipment or, or a computer. Ed. We did the same thing on the 1401s downstairs. Yeah, did everybody hear that? Uh, they did the same thing on the 1401s uh, as well downstairs. So now, now you're ready to connect it up. And you connect it up now with the modules in place, everything's there, um, and, and you test all the power supply voltages. If any are out of spec, you turn it off. Because you could have a shorted module. There could be something else that's wrong in the system that makes the voltages wacko. Never leave it on. You know, um, it, 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 you may say, "Well, this isn't a critical circuit. This is only the minus five. You know, that's not critical. How do you know it's not critical? It could be something that, you know, is a bias or something on some transistor, and you're just putting a huge load in the system. So, every, you check every power supply." If you're lucky enough to have multiple meters, put multiple meters on it when you first turn the power on and just make sure that everything is cool in terms of voltage um, when you start. So what does this imply if we're, we're talking about test gear? We've been talking like, we, like you have all this stuff or you have these things I'm talking about, so let's talk about specifics. If you're gonna, if you're gonna do restoration, what kind of stuff do you need to do restoration? Well, the most essential things are digital voltmeter or a multimeter. Um, you can use an analog if you want, it'll work. Um, but I find digital is easier, but a, a digital volt ohm meter uh, or a multimeter, so-called. Uh, you need an oscilloscope, you're gonna need it for debugging logic. Uh, and it should be about 10 times the speed of what you're debugging. What this means is if the clock of the machine that you're debugging is 10 megahertz, you want a 100 megahertz um, oscilloscope. And some of you will say, Lyle, you're wrong. Why? That's not the Nyquest frequency. Nyquest only says you need a scope that's two times as fast, right? Well, that's true, sort of. Uh, the fact is that's, that's theoretically true, practically speaking, you're better, much better off at 10 times. So that means if, you're, if the machine you're working on is 20 megahertz, you better use a 200 megahertz scope if you wanna see proper wave shapes in your waveforms. And uh, uh, it, I know that this sounds like a commercial, but if you look at the Tektronix website and, they, and you look at how they want you to do, they'll say 10 times also. So not only does my personal experience show that that's true, but Tektronix themselves says it, one could say, well, they're just doing it for marketing reasons, but no, it's not. There's a real reason to do that because you want, it, you want to be able to see real, the sharpness and the, the character of the pulses of the computer you're working with. Um, now, the question is, well, what other things can you use? Or, and, and these are things that you can use. In rare cases, they're essential but most of the time they are not. You can get away without them. Sometimes it's a lot more work if you don't have them, and sometimes a lot more work if you do have them. And what I mean by that is, uh, one of the things that I love to use is a digital storage scope. Now the advantage of a digital storage scope as opposed to just a straight analog, I love analog oscilloscopes by the way, I use, use them, that's always the first thing I jump for is a, a, you know, a nice Tektronix analog scope. But if I'm looking and I want to preserve pictures of what I'm doing, which is really, I think, a very smart thing to do. If you're looking, let's suppose you're debugging core memory and you want to look, you know, you, you finally get it to the place where you've adjusted and tweaked it and you're working with a scope 
and you've got it where it's really working right, you want to take pictures of the X and Y pulses. You want to take the strobe pulses and their relationship to each other. And a digital storage oscilloscope will store those waveforms, and, and almost all of them will allow you to dump them out to a printer or, or through a GPIB port or a USB port and allow you to, you know, bring them up and again print them someplace. And that is really a valuable thing, especially if you have to go back and fix it. And it's out of, you know, it's out of whack again. They, it happens. So that's a, that's a smart thing to do. So digital storage oscilloscope is a very helpful thing. And I often get asked, well, what about logic analyzers? Well, I use them. I think they're good. Uh, they're valuable. They're very different than oscilloscopes in the sense that they, uh, um, they take lots of leads. I mean, uh, typically when you use a logic analyzer, you're going to use something like probably 40 or 50 probes into a circuit. Um, and because you're really trying to figure out what's going on, and sometimes it's the only tool you can use. Uh, you, a oscilloscope just won't do it for you. But for most of you, and for most things that you're debugging, it's not a requirement. And the other thing about uh, uh, these that is very important, and we'll, we'll see this in a moment, uh, if, you, if you go out and you buy a logic analyzer, often they're not too expensive on eBay. You say, oh, this is cool, I can buy a logic analyzer pretty cheap, until you look for what? Probes. The probes are the most expensive part of the logic analyzer. So don't get fooled into saying, oh, this is a nice, cheap logic analyzer on eBay. I'll buy it. And then you can't do anything with it because it doesn't have the probes. And then when you go out to buy the probes, you find the probes cost 10 times as much as the logic analyzer. Uh, so uh, it's one of those tools that you, uh, that you again, if you need it, you really, you, you, you know, if it's a, there's a rare occasions where it's essential. If you're debugging, you know, uh, some very sophisticated computers, uh, yes, you need to do it. If you're, if you're debugging an Alto, you better have a logic analyzer. But if you're debugging a microprocessor computer, uh, S100 bus computer, you don't need a logic analyzer. It's not essential. Um, it's helpful to have all kinds of f these fun things like generators and counters. Uh, one thing I would suggest, the breakout boxes, I'll show you some pictures of these things later. Um, uh, those things are cool and helpful to have, especially if you're dealing with serial circuits. And then uh, I think it's helpful to have an LCR meter, which is inductance and capacitance meter. That, that obviously is a lot of help. And if you're dealing with power supplies a lot, an ESR meter uh, is a good thing to have. So what do they look like? Well, here's typical digital multimeter. Next to it here is a typical LCR meter. Um, this is one of my favorite analog scopes, the Tech 2465. It's 350 megahertz, uh, and it has four channels. Uh, typically, you only need two channels, but four is sometimes really cool, really helpful. If you, if you, do, if you don't have a lot of money to spend and you still want to have a DSO, uh, one of these Chinese hand techs is actually quite good. I was shocked. I bought one of these, and uh, this one is a, not only a digital storage oscilloscope, but it also has a, um, a arbitrary waveform generator. It can generate functions and all this kind of stuff. I think this thing cost me like $250. Uh, and it's nice and portable and easy. And it's a 100 megahertz scope. So that's not too bad a deal. Here's, here's one of my favorite digital storage scopes. Again, four channels, LaCroix 9254. Um, <laughs> these are expensive if you buy them on eBay running. The best thing to do is buy two or three of them not running and fix it, OK? Uh, I think I got this one, which is a, um, a 500 megahertz DSO that will run up to 10 gigahertz sampling. I think the total cost after buying multiple scopes to make this one work was something in the year of $250. So that's a lot of scope for 250 bucks. And this is kind of what, this is what the LaCroix does. This, this was doing. I know you probably, most of you will never do this or care, but this is taking a, a, a square wave and doing a fast Fourier transform. And you can see the thing at the top, and it looks really cool. Anyway, so here's what a logic analyzer looks like. This is the one I have. This is HP 6500. These go relatively inexpensively. The plug-in modules are not so inexpensive. And this is one where I really screwed up. 
I went and I, and I paid, I, I went and I bought four gigahertz uh, capability. Do you know how many times in the last three years I've used four gigahertz capability in my logic analyzer? Zero. <laughs> that was a waste. Sometimes we do stupid things. And that was a stupid thing. All you need is 100, 100 megahertz is probably plenty. 200, nice. Here's the probes, and these are the babies that, that are, again, cost you the money. It's not, it's not the logic analyzer that costs the money, it's, it's the logic analyzer probes. Okay, one of the things that's really handy for doing RS-232, you know, if you have terminals, serial ports, uh, is breakout box, which is called a Bob, which is on the left-hand side, and then a Fox, which is... Uh, uh, like the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy red dog back. Uh, foxes generate serial output. So you can you know, generate any kind of sequence of ASCII characters or whatever you want. And it's nice to have. You can put it at one end of the line and then you can you know, um, use it to check out serial ports and a bunch of adapters for same. So after all this time that we spent getting ready, we could finally now start debugging our system. And so how we do that now becomes dependent on what kind of system we're going to debug. Um, if we have a microprocessor-based system, uh, the cool thing about microprocessor systems is they typically work or they don't. Uh, you hardly ever get an in-between state where it partially works. I mean, the input-output may partially work, but the CPU usually works or doesn't work. The memory typically works or doesn't work. So that makes debugging easier. Uh, the primary issues tend to be the CPU or the support, chi the support chips or the memory of the device. Um, and once in a while you're lucky and it has a front panel, it's a great place to start in any computer that, that has a front panel, is at the front panel. Um, and you basically do things like store or examine memory, store memory, make sure that's working, and then start working your way through uh, control logic and things like that. And if you don't have any response, then you start looking uh, for clock signals. That's always a, the, the next place I look. And always when I, whether it's a microprocessor or a mini computer, if I get no response from the system at all, I go look at the clock signals and the clock and the, and the bus signals. Uh, so basically, once I look at these, I trace the signals, which are the clock and the bus signal, through the chips. So typically, you have a sequence of chips that process the, 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 the timing of the system. And you can look at the schematic. Often, there's a functional spec that will define for you the timing in the machine. If the timing isn't working right, nothing's going to work right. There's no point in going through and trying to figure other stuff out until you know that the timing chain is correct in the machine. So that's, that's something that's really a critical thing. And a lot of people don't do this. I mean, I tend to be very methodical. I have a, t have a standard way of doing it because I know I found from experience this works the best for me. Something else may work better for you. I'm not trying to be dogmatic about this, but my experience is that checking through the clock and making sure all those work is essential because you, <laughs> nothing's going to work right if they're wrong. And if it has a display which is not working, one of the things that's kind of cool uh, is to bypass whatever the display is. Sometimes you have a problem with a high voltage supply in a display, or, or in, a, in, in some cases, maybe a flyback transformer is bad, or you don't know what it is. The display doesn't show anything. But if you look at the signals going into the CRT, you may find the signals are right. In which case, what you might want to do is bypass the internal CRT, take those signals, and put them on an XY uh, scope. You can, you know, they're relatively, 600 series uh, Tektronics or something like that. But they're, they're relatively inexpensive. You can buy them on eBay. Um, and, uh, and you just, you know, go into the X axis, the Y axis, and the Z axis, and you essentially got, a pair, uh, you know, another display. And it, therefore, you can look at what it's doing and maybe running fine. Maybe the only problem you have is in the CRT circuit. And so you've bypassed that. And now you're getting to display you know, what, what the system is doing. And that can be really helpful. 
you know, because otherwise, you know, you can, you can tear your hair out trying to get something to display. Um, and and, you, and you, it's nice to know that the rest of the system is working. Now, what do you do in a microprocessor system if you don't have a schematic? Well, the only thing you can do at that point is make sure that, that the signals on the chips make sense. What do I mean by that? It means you, let's suppose it's TTL logic in the machine. You go through and you check the inputs of the chips and the outputs for the chips. Really boring, but at least you can do it. It's something you can do. And to make sure that everything looks logical, if you have two inputs that are a certain direction and the output's supposed to be a certain direction and it's not, well, maybe that chip is bad. Or maybe it's a chip following that's bad, that's shorted out. But at least you're, you're, you know, you're getting someplace. You're making progress. It's dull, it's boring, it's time consuming. But if you don't have a schematic, that's the way to do it. And if you're, if you, or the other thing you can do, of course, is trace it out. Uh, that's especially true on really old computers that only have like a couple of layers. But you get a modern computer that has four or five layers and you're gonna tear your hair out and probably get no place. So what about mini computers? which I, I love, I love mini computers. You can tell that from my collection of stuff. Uh, they're called blinking lights machine for good reason because they have front panels typically, um, or they have a soft console and they make debugging quite simple in many cases. Uh, you do things like you examine and you store memory and if, if that works on your machine, you're really in great shape. I mean, if I get a machine, <laughs> And I, and, I, and I test out you know, the memory by just doing stores and examines, and I jump through a bunch of locations of memory and it works, I'm a happy camper. I'm a really happy camper. Uh, because I know that most of the machine has to be functioning to get me that far. The clocks probably have to be right. The memory timing has to be about right. I mean, there may be some, you know, there's gonna be other problems obviously, but um, it's a great start if, if that will work. Um, if that works, um, you can try booting a basic instruction diagnostic and you'll probably fail. It probably won't boot. It's worth a shot. I always try it. 95% uh, 90, of the time, nothing happens. It doesn't boot, but that's all right. It's worth a shot. But if booting fails, write, write simple diagnostics. And I've done this a skillion times on machines. Basically, what you do is you start writing small instruction things, like you go, and, a, and almost all computers have an increment accumulator instruction or in, increment some register instruction. And you just do increment that register and jump back and do that again. Because if you do something really simple like that, you can work your way through the instructions one at a time <laughs> until you see which ones work and which ones don't. So, you know, you, you, you do that kind of thing first. So writing lots of small little programs, I, I mean, when we, for instance, I'll give you an instance here at the museum. When we did the PDP-1, I'll bet we wrote 100 small programs before we ever tried to run a deck diagnostic on the machine. Uh, because we, we, and we checked out every instruction, you know, with a simple program. Because the simpler you make it, the easier it is to debug. If you find an instruction that's bad, then you go back through the logic circuits and you work your way through and solve that one. And you go to the next one and the next one and the next one. So it's an incremental process when you can do that. Um, so small looping programs that, that test, test things. And I usually write small, small programs to test memory. I write a little memory diagnostic that may be 20 instructions the test memory, you know, puts things in memory, reads it back out, complements it, stores it in memory, reads it out, checks it to make sure it's right. And, you know, you could write it in, like say, 20 instructions. You write a little memory diagnostic that goes through memory. You, you know, you do all that before you ever try to run all the diagnostics that a manufacturer may have. Because it'll just save you a lot of time. It'll, because typically the, the manufacturer's diagnostics check way more way too fast. So doing this incremental approach is something that I found is very valuable. So check that all the registers load, everything stores ones and zeros, then check alternate bits and so forth. If some instructions work, others fail. Try to see if there's common logic between the ones that fail, right? And then fix those. So if nothing seems to work, <laughs> which happens, 
If you're, if, you're, if you're restoring a PDP 8S, by the way, this is gonna happen to you. Nothing will seem to work. PDP 8S has gotta be the worst machine I have ever debugged. Um, I, I, I don't wanna take much time, but I'll just say that it has two clocks, um, and the clocks can never run at the same time, because if they do, it just does really weird things. But they, so they have two total timing chains that are totally different. You try to scope the stupid thing, you know, with two different clock frequencies, and you know the logic is doing all these weird things. It makes it really a mess. But I, you know, I don't want to bore you with that. Anyway, so you check the clock or the clocks in the machine, then you check the timing chain, then you check memory timing, and the memory cycle, and if it's core, you check the strobe on the core, um, and then once you, once you finally get that stuff kind of working. Then you go back to your console front panel and, and see what you can get working there. If you, it, my experience is if you can get the front panel doing what it's supposed to do, you've got probably 50 or 60% of the machine running the way it should. So uh, you know, using, using that front panel on a mini computer is really a critical thing. Um, So if it's still not working, you might want to use a logic analyzer and look at timing chains and critical internal registers and so forth. We, I don't want to bore you with this because we could spend a whole hour on logic analyzers. So let's go back to something more rudimentary that we can all deal with, um, which is what do the log entries look like? Well, here, here's a log entry I did when I just was testing my, my I went back to my, my PDP 8S and said, oh, I want to test it. Because I like to do that every, you know, once in a while, like every two or three months, see how it's running. So you can see here, you know, the date, A2, um, what I, my intention was to run Focal 69. I loaded the rim loader okay, I loaded the binary loader okay, I loaded Focal 69 okay. I, I ran a test and I wrote a bad program, but it did what I expected to do, so I was a happy camper. Um, so it ran all right. So the, the log entries, you notice that they're not... Fancy, you know, they're not fancy, but they just tell you what you've done. Uh, now here's a, here's a, now this was a little harder to see, but here's a, um, here's a log entry when I was debugging the PDP 8S, and um, I certainly won't bore you with going through what it says, but you can get the idea that I was testing a lot of things and testing a lot of bits, and I was explaining to myself what I was doing and what they look like. Uh, in some cases, I draw little waveforms and things, but again, I really encourage you to use this kind of a, a, a log book uh, on your system to, so you know what you're doing and you can go back and figure it out. It really also helps if you go back six months later because the same bug reappears. You say, how did I fix that thing? And you go back to your log book and you got it. Okay, very quickly. Once you get your system up to the place where you're gonna do something, now you're gonna, you're gonna uh, uh, need an operating system, and you're probably going to get some application up and running. And uh, again, this is a session, maybe, I was thinking next year maybe I'll come and talk about this, because this is a whole session in itself, which is how do you get, um, how do you get images for operating systems and applications? How do you get them onto the proper media? Um, and as I say here, I could give a four-hour <laughs> seminar on this and only touch the surface. But, you know, the thing is there's lots of user groups, and I strongly suggest this on, in this area, that you, you look for the user groups uh, that deal with the machine. For instance, there's, uh, if you're dealing with Lisa, there's a Lisa users group. Uh, if you're dealing with CPM systems, there's CPM group. Uh, if, you know, S100 bus machines, there's S100. Collaboration is really a key thing when you're debugging computers. There's nothing wrong with calling somebody up and saying, I'm lost, I don't know what to do, or I need help. I do that, I don't have a problem doing that. Um, we all get that place, some, we all get there someplace, and especially in the area of software. This is really a complex area, and, but, but seeking out user groups for techniques on images and specialized software is something that's really a, a, a must. Um, and again, emulators like SimH can help, but um, um, like I said, that, this, that's a whole subject area that we don't have time for. What do you need in terms of reagents? What are the things that you need to clean machines and to work with machines? One of the things I use is al uh, absolute isopropyl alcohol. 
That's essentially all the water's out of it. It's like 99.995% isopropyl alcohol. You can use that to clean heads of you know, disk drives. You can use it to clean heads of floppy drives, things like that, and not, or tape drives, and not, and not have a problem because there's no water in it. It's just pure alcohol. Um, and I also use deoxid uh, in two places. Uh, deoxid has a, a, a fader lube that's good for potentiometers, uh, to get the noise out of potentiometers, because you know potentiometers get noisy. You put fader lube in it, and it takes away the noise out of the device. Um, there's something uh, called deoxid, and deoxid uh, is something that takes away um, rust, but it's gentle. It's not something like oxalic acid or navel jelly or something like that that can hurt your machine. It, it doesn't destroy uh, traces. It doesn't destroy other things. So it's a good thing to use uh, to, to clean up uh, you know, uh, rusty things or, um, or, or battery spills. Like you know, sometimes uh, NICAD batteries will spill on boards and things like that. And then there's the oxid gold. It's one of the things that I love. Um, I had a PDP-8E uh, that I had restored. It was running pretty well. Then I started getting memory errors. I tested it all out, tested the memory. Everything was perfect. Um, and yet I had memory errors occasionally. I put deoxid gold on all the contacts and plugged it back in. And it's now run for, I don't know, six, seven years without a failure. So trust me, it, it, and the millet that NASA uses it in their, in their space program for, for making good contacts. So it's something that I found is safe. I've never had to hurt anything, but it does magic when it comes to making good contact, especially for gold contacts. So much for the advertisement. Um, we'll run out of time. Uh, I have other junk here that I could talk about, but uh, I, have, I have time for a few, a few minutes for questions because I was, I, I was told I could run over a little bit. So do you have any questions? Yes. Why don't we go up here first? The question is, do I, uh, on capacitors, do I take them out of the board or what do I do to test them? Well, it depends on the circuit. Sometimes you can leave the capacitor in the circuit. It, it all depends. If the capacitor is sitting there, it all has a diode on it or something like that. Um, you can, as long as the voltage is the right direction, if you will, uh, it, in other words, it can't go back through the, the diode, you can just leave the, the, the capacitor in the circuit. Most typically, you have to take it out of the circuit because there's too many, too many things that can get in your way. So uh, I, I would say probably 95% of the time, you've got to take the capacitor out of the circuit. Um, question to the back, yes. Oh, that was your question? Oh, okay, <laughs> good. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I had it up. Maybe I just pushed. Where am I? Oh, I see what happened. It went weird on me. It's a Microsoft product. No, I'm sorry. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, the, qu the question is, um, what, uh, what is it that makes me like one computer over another? Uh, is that close enough? <laughs> so, um, well, first of all, I just like blinking lights machines. I like machines that have uh, lights on them and have uh, switches on them because I think they're fun. They're, they're fun to watch run, uh, and they're cool, I think. <laughs> so I guess I favor that because of that. Um, I also like machines that, the, the, that, I can, that have a very interesting operating system. For instance, when I restored the Lisa here, and I put the Lisa OS on it, which is so unique and so different and so ahead of its time and so different than Macintosh um, uh, and so advanced over Macintosh. I mean, that, I mean, that to me is exciting. So it's worth restoring a machine to get the software running, uh, you know, for me. I, I just find that exciting. I love operating systems. Um, I love running um, OS 8 
you know, on, on PDP-8s. Uh, um, I love running RT-11 on PDP-11s or RSX or TSX Plus, or, you know, you name it. Uh, so I get as much joy out of the software side once I get it running. So uh, part of my motivation in getting the machine running is so I can play with the software. So that, that motivates me highly. If there's no software available for it, I'm pretty bored, you know. Getting a piece of hardware running and all it does is sit there does not excite me. <laughs> okay. Any, any other questions? Yes. So the question is on cables and things like that. Sometimes they're really hard to get. Uh, and sometimes they're very sensitive. I know like on some silicon graphic machines I have, they have super uh, wacko cables that are, are just really uh, uh, difficult to get. Um, the only thing I've been able to find is finding the source uh, through other collectors of those kinds of cables. Um, again, it's good to, f to join the user groups or, and, know, you know, and just learn to know the people that have stuff. Um, and uh, um, because they are specialized cables, you, the likelihood of going to weird stuff or going to Anchor Electronics or, um, you know, HSC or any of those places, getting is just so remote, it's almost not worth your energy. Uh, so if it's a difficult cable, that's it. If it's a simple cable, by the way, I, boy, I bought a lot of cables at Weird Stuff, a lot of cables at Weird Stuff, right? Um, they, have a, they have amazing supply of stuff like that. Um, by the way, can I, I, I'm going to put a plug in for weird stuff. I know I'm out of time, but I'm going to put a little plug in for them. Um, I have worked with the management of weird stuff for probably 15 years uh, or more, uh, a lot of time. And uh, they used to just, you know, get stuff, old stuff, and they would literally plug it in to see, you know, if it worked or not. And if it didn't, they would scrap it. Um, and if it worked, they would, you know, they would try selling it. Um, and I convinced them never to turn it on. And I, and I, I mean, I spent months with them, don't turn it on. You know, please don't turn it on. And finally I said, look, if you get it in, call me. And then I'll make a decision for you. And then they'd go, oh, okay. So then they started calling me. So I still have that relationship with them. So when they get something cool in, they call me up and they say, okay, Lyle, we got this in, what do we do? Now, I'll tell you what I did for them, because I, 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 I make it reciprocal. They got a nice IMSA in uh, that had a front panel. I mean, 8080 IMSA. They said, we just got this IMSA in. I said, I hate to ask this. I said, what did you pay for it? They said, $15. And I went, ooh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, they said, did we get a good deal? I said, you got an incredible deal, <laughs> you know? And so I went, I actually went to Weird Stuff. I tested it. It, it had the original MSI um, CPU, uh, you know? It had memory. Uh, and so I, 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 I went through and I reformed the capacitors and the power supply for them. I turned it on. I tested it. Then I did a, a YouTube video for them. And, and I gave it to them. I said, here's a YouTube video. They put it on their advertisement on eBay, right? And they, they were able to sell it for $1,500. So they like me. So I want, but, I, but, but they're good people. You know, they want to do the right thing. They really, the, honest to God, they care about old computers now. And you notice, I don't know if many of you have noticed, they're putting old computers in the retail store now. When they get old computers in, I, I've got them not, not, not even thinking scrap, put them in the store. So if you visit Weird Stuff now, you're going to see old computers in the store. So they're good guys. I mean, and they really want to preserve, they understand preservation. So I've spent a lot of hours explaining preservation. And I brought them here to the museum and, you know, said, you know, this is important stuff you're doing. You're making a difference. So anyway, that's a long pitch. I'm sorry. Anything else? If not, that's it, guys. Thanks. Thanks.